in there and this clerk noticed it. And so, boy, he's calling everybody around and gone around there and he said, boy, this, this is the highest award the Air Force gives. It's, uh, he says, it's equivalent to the, I didn't say this, he says, it's equivalent to the Medal of Honor, saying he was raving to everybody. And so he says, we should be giving you a coat rather or suit rather than you coming in here to buy one. And my daughter went over and picked up this jacket and brought it over and looked at it. So I tried not to, yeah, I'll buy it. So he just, he wanted me to buy it. So when we got through, this guy says, true to my word, here's this jacket. And put it in the sack and gave it to me. So it's my flight jacket. <laughs> but anyway, uh, getting back to the to the China and to know why we were fighting in China. That uh, I don't know. It seems like from what I talk to my grandkids and so forth, they don't tell them very much about history anymore. But in 1927, Baron Tishi Tanaka wrote a memorial on conquering the world, and he laid out a plan. First point, of course, China was the object. China, the largest country in the world, over four million square miles, and every one out of every five people in the world is a Chinaman. Look what that could do for Japan if they'd have all of that land with their natural resources and all that mine power. So it started in 1931, and Japan invaded Manchuria to get all those natural resources. But another thing that was important, China was a country, but not a nation. Now that sounds a little funny, but this is, this is true. China was broken up into many provinces, and each one was a little government in itself. And many of them had an army of their own. And this sounds peculiar at this time, but China, in all the history of the world, had never been an aggressive nation. And weren't until the communists came along. And so, Japan, this Tanaka wrote this memorial of how this would happen. And they would invade China and take these problems one at a time, slowly, so that it didn't arouse the rest of the world. And that's what they did until it got to the point it did arouse the rest of the world. And they stockpiled uh, raw materials, oil, and everything else, buying from the United States or wherever they could. And the United States finally wised up and put an embargo on it that they couldn't have this. And because they had gone so far into capturing China that their lines become difficult to, to uh, supply and so forth, and because of the prejudice that became against them from the United States and other countries, and the way the war was going in Europe, they decided they'd have to skip that second part of completely uh, capturing China and move on down through the, through the Indies there, and Singapore, and into to Australia. And that they did, and attacked the United States, which was the fourth thing that they were to do. Well, of course, with the underhanded cowardice attack, they attacked Pearl Harbor, without, Pearl Harbor without warning, all according to Tanaka's memorial. And why we weren't smart enough as Americans to know what was going to happen is, is hard to understand. Because here he'd written out there in a blueprint and laid it before us, but it happened. And so it was then, hey, we've got to support, just like the book here said, to support China so that it can open up a second front and make it easier for the, to win the war in the Pacific. And that's why we were in China. There were no troops in China. The United States never sent tro troops over there. Why should they? The Japanese got one out of every five troops in the, in the world's Chinamen. So, but they had, you know, they were backward. Back in Luniang, where I was stationed, there were no roads, there were no utilities, there was no sanitation, no nothing. And this is typical in the, in the, uh, after you got off the coast of China, and the Japs occupied all of the coast, which made it impossible to get anything into China except fly it. Of course, you remember they built the Burma Road, but that was a flop. 
it was too hard to travel in the first place, and then if they did with the convoy, most of them were were attacked by pirates and everything was lost anyway, so we flew it into the, the supplies in, which were basically was... <coughs> the boy said, I can't have more than an hour, and I've sure been talking away here. <laughs> anyway, we... Uh, At, from Assam Valley and Super King was the base mostly of where we flew, where we flew to, and where they flew into our base at Chan, at uh, Luliang, China. And an airplane took off there, flying supplies every six minutes. The biggest <coughs> commodity I think that they flew was gasoline, flying them over in 55-gallon drums. And then from there, I would fly them up to the forward areas wherever they were needed. And while we were there, we, when the Chinese offensive was getting ready to start, they needed an airfield in, in central China to push this off. And we flew uh, into this field. And it was hard to find airfields in China. There's just not enough, there's just no place to put them. And I don't mean by, by people, the land. Because when we left the foothills of the Himalayas, you get out to what, what similar to the Plains area of the United States, but all over there's little lime mountains. I assume they were lime, just like sticking ice cream cones up and down, see? And they were rice paddy and stuff all around inside them, but there's just no place to land an airplane. And so Chikiang was an airfield that had 4,300 feet, which is not very long. And it was necessary to have a perfect 6,500 feet. The trouble is, here's Chikiang. On this end's a river. On the other end is a valley that dropped about 200 to 300 feet. Could you believe that that Chinese filled that valley in in six weeks by hand? That's the only way they did things over there. They never had any equipment. And they filled it in by hand by carrying dirt over their shoulders and making an airfield by, call, by hauling rocks and, uh, out of the river and, and breaking them up and making them about, stacking them about two and a half feet deep and then covering them with the, mine, with the muddy slime and pulling a roller over it. And that roller was pulled by 500 Chinese coolies. Now I have pictures of this and it's amazing to think that the Chinese could do such a thing in a short a thing in such a short period of time by hand. But anyway, because of this, we were able to kick the Japs in the seat and push them back from where they belong. And about some of the conditions I'd be I'd talk about we lived in in China, because when we got there, we were signed the quarters, had we slept on a cot that was made with homemade rope that was prickly, and we had a little mattress about yay thick full of straw. We slept in, mon in uh, army blankets, no sheets, no pillows. We slept under mosquito nets, not to keep the mosquitoes off, but to keep the rats off. Our water, like, well, we just didn't drink it. it was, we, we had so much chlorine in it that you, we were drinking mostly chlorine anyway. And when they, we took a shower, they haul water up on the, in a water buffalo on a cart, call, hauling up in drums of water out of the river, and they'd go up and pour these drums up above the, on the roof so it'd drain down and we could have a shower. And if you got there when that water was fill, first filled, it looked like you had chocolate running down your chest. I'd have to, and, and we lived off the Chinese. We couldn't eat anything unless it was absolutely 100% thoroughly cooked. And I'd have to say that the year I spent in China is the worst year in my life. But, on the other hand, when somebody says China now, my ears perk up and, hey, that's about one of the best years of my life. And I guess that's human nature. You forget the bad things and remember the good things. And flying in China was rough. And I'll just tell you a couple of quick experiences about that. The first, my first flight as a first pilot there, we 
they had the regulation when we got there you were supposed to make 10 flights with the co-pilot and I think six flights with a, an instructor and then you'd fly 10 daylight mission before you flew a night mission but they needed the first pilot so badly that when I got there I had two flights instructor but boy I was off to super tank night time what an experience I had off of Six thousand people there. Our batteries died. You mean I'm not weak? I'm not strong enough? Huh? <laughs> anyway, yeah. Time out. And I apologize for that. But I tried. I tried to thought maybe when I first saw these clouds, we could climb over them. And uh, we were flying at 20,000 feet, and I tried to climb up to higher, but 22,000 feet is all we could make. But that was useless because those clouds went up so high that there's no way open. Oh, I do have to get right in front of the mic. Better? Better? Okay. <laughs> you know, and I, we flying into this front, these thunderstorms, and I had, I could, there was lightning here, there, here, here, you, the sky was never dark. And we flew into the, into this weather, and of course got bounced around good, and, and we picked up St. Elmo's fire. Now they told me that, that'll never hurt you. But it can sure scare the daylights out of you. <laughs> It's out on the front of the propellers, here's these big old orange flames going out about six or seven feet, and on the windshield wipers, purple ones going out about a foot and a half, and the wings looked like a neon sign from the, from the static electricity jumping from rivet to rivet. You know, we get right over the Sawing Pass, that's the, the main point before we fly over the hump, and I, we lost our left engine. Their mountains are 16,000 feet high. And of course we can't hold our altitude, there's no chance. And we dropped down to 16,000 feet. And boy, I was thinking my career here as a pilot is soon coming to an end. But like the story that Colonel Scott wrote over in China, entitled God is my co-pilot. And many of I think have probably read it or seen it. And we made a movie of it in which Dennis Morgan starred and God is my co-pilot. God was my co-pilot. As we got about to 16,000 feet, the engine started. Miraculously. I guess we I guess we picked up carburetor eyes. Boy, what a great feeling. We were able to climb back out and get our altitude and complete the mission. And one week later to the day, I was assigned to fly up and to Mo Lang Ping up from the northern part of China. And they signed me to go out at 20,000 feet, but I had 16 GIs aboard and no oxygen for them. So I called back and asked for a lower altitude, and they signed me at 16,000. If I'd have stayed at 20, we'd have no problem, but we'd go up at 16,000 and we'd take off and go into the super on instruments for about 20 minutes. Smooth as standing here, no problem, I'm a trained instrument pilot. But all of a sudden we could start seeing some clear ice forming on the, on the windshield wipers. I'd throw the spotlight out on the wings and you could see ice forming. So I told my co-pilot, I said, why don't we turn around and climb over this but before we could get turned around, we are losing altitude. We couldn't hold it. And the ice came on that quickly. Minimum altitude was 13,500 feet. And we dropped down to 13. And I gave the order to throw out the cargo. And they, when they opened the door to throw the cargo out, I mean, it was uh, at least a half an inch of ice on the door all over the fuselage of the airplane. And they threw out all of this, all the supplies, all of these GIs threw out their, their duffel bags and their belongings. 
and even throughout the emergency equipment. But we were able to hold their altitude. And I found it by pulling back on the wheel and I could, before it really stalled, I could gain a, a, a hundred feet and we'd lose about 50 feet getting a little flying speed back, but I gained 50. And finally we're up to minimum altitude of 13.5 and I couldn't get any more. And for some reason, these GIs all of a sudden ran to the back of the airplane and boy, we did stall out and we're back down to 13,000 feet again. And I told my crew chief, I yelled to him, I says, go back and tell those GIs to sit down. I don't want one of them to move until I tell you they can move, until I tell them they can move. And what I found later, he didn't know go back and tell them to sit down. He pulled his 45 on them and threatened to shoot any one of them if they did move. <laughs> And you know, the PR said on those engines, R2800s, that they could fly them for, for a maximum of, of uh, 4,000, or uh, RP, uh, uh, yeah, 4,000 RPM and a, a, a mercury of 40 inches. They'd do better than that. We pulled all we could get, and went for 120 minutes to fly out of that weather. When we finally got out of it, things looked all right. I went back to to uh, take to talk to these GIs and cheer them up, and boy, I never saw 16 faces more white than theirs were, and not one of them would crack a smile. And well, I can't blame them. <laughs> I'd leave that out, but I'd scare you to death. <laughs> I was pretty shook up too. But anyway, that gave me a good example of what my flying was going to be in China, and we'll leave that to the wind and, and uh, go on. But we had a lot of fun in China too. We had to make our own fun, and we used to play volleyball, and we called Luliang rules, and that meant anything you could get away with counted. But we had fun doing it. And the, uh, you make friends and have good camaraderie with your crew and with the with the fellow officers there because you got to know each one of them so well and we had and uh, we had a lot of fun and when because we're clear out there in the boondocks away from the world we, um, we used to do a lot of things and I soon learned that I hated oxygen so I was empty and there's 15 feet between that that uh, peak over there or that hill and the clouds that's where you'd find me. And I was flying up and down in the, in the, in the flats over the, over the rice paddies one day, and I was low enough that if I came to a tree, I'd have to lift my wing up over it. And all of a sudden, there's a Chinese coolie woman in front of me in a rice paddy in the path between them when they were about yay wide. They didn't waste any land if they could help it. And that woman saw me coming, and, and first she darts this way, and then this way, and then head first right into the right into the rice paddy. Now I wasn't, no, darn it, <laughs> I wasn't mean, it just happened. <laughs> but then we used to fly down the Yangtze River and we'd fly down below the banks to keep out of the radar from the Japs and, and uh, this was the devil that got to me down there and fly over some of those sand pans when you'd see some and I put, I can put my feet up on the instant panel and pull that little back with all my strength and look back there and those sand pans were <laughs> the devil made me do it, see. <laughs> anyway, that was that was the life in China and I'm flying up talk about a little about a C forty six because they were a great airplane. They had received an unfair reputation as being a bad airplane, and that's not true. They saved the day from China and flying over the hump. A C-47 couldn't fly that high. Now, I know they got credit for some of this, but the C-47s never did fly the hump. Down over Burma on the on the on the low on the low altitudes at 13,000 feet. I'll back up and say they did that, but they never did fly up over the Salween Pass and over the area there. 
towards the latter end of the war, they never did fly into China. And, uh, but the air, but C-46 was a good airplane, and it had one real good characteristic about it, which is the only airplane that I know that does this, except for P-61, and it has spoilers, so that uh, takes care of that. But uh, where an other airplane, any place you want, the drones you want to pick up when they stall out, it's in the wing tip in. But a C-46 stalled from the fuse watch out. And as a result, it never did flip off on the wing or anything if you stall. When you Speak to the microphone, please. Get that thing down here. <laughs> but they would, it, would, it, wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't stall out. And I've taken the C-46 and hope we went back to the just shake with you, and it's just fluttered down. And I used to have some fun sometimes when I was when I was a line check pilot, and get when some pilot in there that'd come over and check him out in the C-46, and one of these hot rod pilots, and I'd say, "Do me a do me a power on stall to the right or to the left, whichever." But generally to the right, because I'm sitting in the co-pilot seat, and, and he'd think, "Hold oh, on, what's this?" So they'd get up there and about to the peak of the, of the stall power on and I'd reach up and cut the right engine. Hey, he wasn't a hot rod anymore. Boy, you had really put him into high gear, but you know that airplane didn't do a thing. Just never did it but over. And so it was a good airplane and I had a good experience while I was there. They were my young and adventuresome years. And if I were young, and have the opportunity, I'd go back and do it all over again. And if you've got any questions, I'll try and answer them and we'll go from there. When you carried cargo from China back out across the hall, what was the cargo? Well, uh, actually, most of the time when we flew from China back, we were empty. We were empty most yeah. of the time. Yeah. Of course, you know, there's going to be some things sometimes that fly, but most of the time it was empty. We generally fly a whole bunch of barrels back. But, we, but uh, actually, cargo was something not very much. Uh, you, you explained uh, why you uh, didn't initially join up to become a pilot on the front end of the war. Now in the back end, when the war is done, he sounds like you had a great time. Well, why wouldn't you and thousands and thousands of others like you not wanted to stay in Australia? <laughs> well, that's a good question, I guess. I don't know. I, I, uh, I uh, of course, I, I got in it before the, war, before the tail end of the war. But uh, I, I don't know. I, I guess I left home. When I got out of this, uh, this, this service and back from over China, I had, a, I had a standing offer. Supposedly, anyway, from Eastern Airlines, and all I had to do was end up at their office to fly. See, but I've been away from home for over six years, and away from my family, and I wanted to come home. Good enough. <laughs> Dick, why tell us about that uh, incident on Iwo Jima? Oh, I don't, I don't want to get in that, Dick. If we, I've been here so long that it's my time's up, and I. <laughs> If you, if you see the Saints at War, turn to page 414 and you can read about that. <laughs> Any other questions? Is that all right, Dick? Which kind of airplane was it? I had a C-46. Mm -hmm. I had, I had 2,000 hours flying time while I was in the service, which was quite a bit. And I spent, and I had over 1,200 hours in the C-46. <laughs> what, what, what was that? <laughs> a white jacket? <laughs> Where was that store with the free jacket? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for putting up with me, folks, and I. I had a hand go up over here. I wonder, is that a GI tooth you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, can't you see that? It's, 
A2 jacket and everything. Once again, I apologize for the sound system. We think we improved, but I don't know whether we're making any progress or not. This year, Clyde, we're hot eyeing our B24. And so we present that to you as your token payment. I appreciate you coming up and spending an hour with us. It is not a GI tooth. I was in that business in the service. It was not a GI tooth. <laughs> Thank you very much.